is a motion to approve a statutory rule. I will ask the clerk to read the motion. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 be approved. Thank you. I call the Junior Minister, Mr Declan Kearney, to move the motion. Order. The member has to say, I beg to move. Sorry, I was just about to say that. Gormaigat alias Kian Corlia, I beg to move. As Run Duhlanach Shaw at Hatos or Gore or Margin. And as I propose uh, the motion today, I do so with very mixed feelings. Until very recently, I never thought that as a minister I would be putting forward regulations such as these. But these regulations are designed to be preventative. They are in place to protect people. Ni more gome cosinch and fubble mark free for cosbord doenia galier. Supporting measures to close businesses, protect people's livelihoods, while restricting mobility are a necessary cost that we must all pay to get through this health emergency. We must all put the needs of our citizens first. Important as economic reconstruction will be, economic interests at this time cannot take primacy over public health. The ravages of this terrible disease have dictated the need for legislation to close churches and cemeteries and empty our high streets the length and breadth of this island. Over 2,500 of our fellow citizens have been affected and, tragically, over 200 have lost their lives. Families bereaved in the most trying of circumstances are unable to comfort loved ones who are dying or to mourn them as they would wish. And our health and social care colleagues, our heroes, Speaker, risk their lives daily to win the battle against this pandemic. And that is why these regulations are a vital necessity, because without them, the battle against COVID-19 would be lost. The regulations were made and came into operation on the 28th of March in the knowledge that democratic scrutiny by this Assembly would follow. It was not a decision taken lightly, nor do we take today's proceedings lightly. Through scrutiny, the Assembly must satisfy itself that they are necessary, proportionate and sound. Regarding the content of the regulations, the approach is very similar to that in other jurisdictions. There are three main sets of restrictions. Firstly, many types of business, particularly those with a retail focus, have had to close or change to a takeaway or delivery only mode of operation. Secondly, there are restrictions on gatherings of more than two people, other than for exceptions, such as funerals or providing emergency assistance. And thirdly, and perhaps most profoundly of all, there are restrictions on movement, and no one is allowed to leave home without a lawful purpose. There are provisions for enforcement by the PSNI, and penalties ranging up to £5,000 on summary conviction. I will now clarify some of the things that the regulations do, but also some of the things that they do not. Firstly, in relation to businesses, the regulations do not contain a list of essential businesses. Rather, they list businesses that must close and types of businesses that must repurpose. For everything else, the executive's message is reflected in guidance and communications, and our message is clear. Where people can work from home, they must, and where people must come to work, then they must be able to work safely. The restrictions on citizens' movements are also very tight, and some might even say draconian. But for the most part, the intention of those restrictions has been clearly understood, and levels of compliance within society have been good. However, there is one aspect which is worth clarifying, and that is the question of whether it is lawful to drive in order to take exercise. And the answer lies in the wording of Regulation 5, which refers to the need to take exercise. So if someone needs to drive to take exercise, then they may do so. The PSNI will apply a test of reasonableness to that. A household that has young children or an elderly relative can drive to the local park to exercise safely. Or a person with a disability, such as autism, 
who needs to drive or to be driven to take regular exercise can do so lawfully. However, a leisurely long drive to a resort or a beauty spot must now be off limits for this time. I ask Freve Concordia, the delayed scrutiny of the regulations does have one benefit. We now have evidence to assess how they are in fact working. And crucially, we know the answer to two key questions. Are these regulations needed? And do they work? To answer the first question, we must look to the modelling work carried out by the expert group led by Ian Young. And the modelling group now expects that the peak of the outbreak to be less severe than previously expected, but there are still many difficult weeks and months ahead, right across all of these islands. So we need maximised north-south common approaches adopted, as well as on an east-west basis. The progress achieved through the restrictions will be lost very, very quickly if we relax the restrictions that help to achieve this compliance. Chep orin a un, the darla for shin, and we would be failing ourselves and each other if we did so at this time. The World Health Organisation has warned governments of the dangers that easing restrictions would raise in terms of the spread of further infection. At all times, we should be guided by international best practice and advice. So, Mr. Speaker, the regulations are still needed. Ni more do in Gulier Kolinu Lishnarilaha or one Yanunach. On the second question, the daily situation reports tell me that the regulations are successfully promoting social distancing, and that compliance is producing tangible results. Confirmed cases and deaths so far are less than we feared. Mr. Speaker, the regulations are working, and that credit belongs to all of us who is making the, the sacrifice at this time. There are citizens alive today who would otherwise have died. Consequently, our health service is more than holding its own in this battle. So yes, alias Freeth Kionkorya, the regulations are indeed working. Agasi Kionkorya, I need her. In my own personal experience, I know very well how much hardship and anguish is being caused to family and friends. The executive recognises the resulting distress, anxiety and economic harm. But all parties in our power-sharing government support maintenance of the restrictions at this time. I and executive colleagues understand how extremely difficult it is that members of our families, individual friends and our community are being denied the solace which moments of reflection at gravesides and places of worship can provide. But that is the price that we must pay because the coronavirus pandemic is an emergency. And the fact is that we have not beaten COVID-19. No other interest or priority can take primacy over our public health. There is no room for complacency. We face the possibility of new surges of this pandemic. But equally, we must be vigilant for mutations of this virus and or new pandemics. Because, members, the scourge of lethal pandemics is no longer a reality confined to the outer reaches of Africa or Asia. We are prepared to do all in our power to help businesses, workers and citizens through this. Those efforts will not stop. This battle must be taken forward with a whole government and a whole society approach. Alas, Freve Concurlia, this is a very important debate. The regulations require very careful scrutiny. I trust that having done so, the Assembly will agree with me that they are necessary, proportionate and sound. Jarvium. I also assure members that the regulations will be subject to regular reviews, and the second is due by the 9th of May. And there will be ongoing consideration on the potential of the scope for ending any of the individual restrictions where possible. But all ministers in our executive agree that these restrictions ought not to be removed a single day before it is safe to do so, but equally, not a single day should they remain than necessary. In the meantime, we must continue to give united political and civic leadership. Alias, Freef Tonkoria, Mullum Unrun, Agus Nardilacha, 
Dunchunnel. I commend the regulations to the Assembly. Gormaigat. Thank you. I thank the Junior Minister for his statement. The Business Committee has agreed there should be no time limit in this debate. I would also advise members that the Business Committee has agreed that under the current circumstances, members are entitled to rise in their place if they wish to be called to speak during this debate and any other today. The usual ways of getting your name on the speaking list, informing the business office or approaching the top table are also valid options for members to use. Um, I call now the Chair of the Executive Office Committee, Mr Colin McGrath. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I would echo your earlier uh, remarks, uh, offering condolences to those that have passed away and to their families at this time, and also uh, to offer our continued best wishes to our brave and formidable forces within our health service sector that work uh, tirelessly uh, day and night uh, to help protect our community and care for them. Um, I rise today to speak on behalf of the Committee of the Executive Office. Uh, now, the Committee of the Executive Office did not have lead responsibility for the scrutiny um, of these regulations, but I want to outline the very important link that there is between uh, the role of the Executive Office and that of the Department of Health uh, in the fight against coronavirus. Um, the Coronavirus Act gives the Executive Office powers to make directions uh, to compel the closure of certain premises and to prohibit mass gatherings. However, it also gives the Department of Health uh, powers to make regulations enforcing social distancing uh, on people, and that is what we have before us today. Giving the uh, Executive Office the power to make the directions reflects the cross-cutting and the sensitive and far-reaching nature of the measures that we have, uh, and also uh, will help to continue to have these rules and will have a considerable impact on how we live our everyday lives for the foreseeable future. The deliberate overlap in powers between the Executive Office and the Department of Health allows for directions to be made quickly uh, and to deal with the most pressing issues, followed by more considered development of regulations to deal with ongoing issues. In this case, the regulations impose restrictions on people who are not allowed to leave home without a lawful excuse, uh, gatherings of more two people, and upon businesses. The Health Committee, which has responsibility for the scrutiny of these regulations, considered the statutory rule at a meeting in early April, and I am sure that the chairperson of the Health Committee will share with us the details of the Committee's deliberations. Due to the timing around the laying of the rule, the Committee for the Executive Office did not have an opportunity to consider the regulations before today. However, the Executive Office did provide a comprehensive briefing outlining the background to the making of the regulations and their relationship to the powers of the Executive Office under the Coronavirus Act, and the Committee will consider this at its meeting tomorrow. Um, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I make the following remarks in my capacity as an MLA. Um, coronavirus has presented us with massive challenges. Nobody could have understood or appreciated the impact that the virus uh, was going to have when they first heard of it. And certainly words like surreal and unimaginable are regularly used to describe the situation that we are in. I mean, who could have thought a few months ago that we would be in lockdown, restricted to what we can and cannot do, and when and where we are able to do these things? Now, this legislation is scary. Uh, ordinarily, it would be bad. It, it's draconian uh, and anti-human rights. But we are not in normal times. The response to this virus needs to be mammoth, uh, restrictive, and even feel at times like it's anti-democratic, with no normal time to be able to debate uh, or discuss these massive changes to the rules. The rules are harsh, and in places they are somewhat cruel. To cause loved ones to have to die on, alone and then not permit a funeral and then restrict who can attend the burial and then not let the family visit the graveyard, it is cruelty, but it is necessary in order to stop the spread of the disease and that will save lives. It's cruel, but it's necessary. Uh, people are still dying in our communities. The threat from coronavirus is as serious as ever. And if we let our guard down, we will be opening ourselves to the unnecessary loss of loved ones. 
Now, in recent days, I certainly have seen a lot more movement in our community. And many people are calling for parks and cemeteries and recycling centres to be reopened. But any decision that is taken to relax the restrictions that we're operating under or to change the interpretation of those restrictions has to be underpinned by medical and scientific evidence. So when executive ministers are appearing on radio show shows or on television or at press briefings, they need to explain the rationale for those decisions, including any change that there is to medical advice. The executive must ensure that it appropriately communicates with the community and let them know why and why not things are happening. If closing recycling centres is saving lives, then let's explain that. People will listen to reason, but they need to hear it, and there can be nothing wrong with clarity. Uh, decisions cannot be taken on the basis of simple lobbying. It needs to be underpinned by scientific fact. There also needs to be a roadmap for us to get out of the clutches of this virus. Um, it isn't a tap. It can't be switched off. Uh, it, it isn't seasonal. Uh, it's spring and summer weather isn't going to reduce the impact, and the virus certainly isn't going to be going away on its summer holidays. It is here until we manage our way out of it, and that will require the executive to have a detailed plan, to communicate that plan, and to make sure that everybody stays on side with that plan. Now, I know that people are finding lockdown extremely difficult. I understand those concerns, the fears and the anxieties, because we're all feeling them. But the cost of loosening the restrictions cannot be the lives of the people that we care about. In the absence of clear medical advice, we cannot change the guidance because people do not like being cooped up anymore. We all have that feeling, but it must be underpinned by the scientific facts. Now, successful countries like New Zealand and Germany and South Korea and others have common traits. Testing, community tracing, uh, and working out who has, who hasn't, and who has had this virus. When we get to know all of that, we will contain it better. Then, when we get the vaccine, we will control and eradicate the virus, and then all of the rules and the regulations will not be needed any longer. I cannot wait for that day, and I know that many people feel the same, but patience is needed. Sticking to the rules will save lives, and it's better for us all to stick to the rules for a while than be one of those family members who loses a loved one and can't go to the funeral, or worse still, is being the one that is buried. Let's stick to the rules, let's plan for the way out, let's communicate it to everyone and be prepared should this happen again. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, we accept and support these rules, but we really wish that we didn't have to. Thank you. Thank you. I call the Chair of the Health Committee, Mr. Colin McGrath. Or, sorry, Colin Gilder, new. I beg your pardon. Last prayer, John Corley. Boy, I'm a couple of Fakla, Ara, or Deuce, Marcia Herlock, or Angusta Schlancha. I would like to start my contribution on this matter with expressing. My sincere condolences with those who have lost a loved one during this difficult time. I know that is shared by party colleagues and all members of the Health Committee. It is not easy losing a loved one at any time, but it is perhaps particularly difficult at this time of social distancing and lockdown measures. The Health Committee considered the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations at its meeting on 2 April. The Department advised the Committee that due to the serious and imminent threat Posed by the incidence and spread of coronavirus, the Department was unable to submit an SL1 policy proposal and that the regulations were made without a draft being led and approved, so that public health measures could be taken in response to the serious and imminent threat to public health posed by the incidence and spread of coronavirus. We heard evidence from the Chief Environmental Health Officer in the Department of Health. The Department advised that the regulations cover three main areas restrictions on business permitted to remain open, restrictions on the movement of people, and restrictions on social gatherings. Committee members raised a number of issues, including the importance of comparative information on similar measures 
in the south of Ireland and effective and ongoing north-south cooperation. I welcomed in this respect the Memorandum of Understanding that has been signed by the Chief Medical Officers, North and South, which aimed to ensure cooperation and harmonised messages were possible and highlighted that cooperation is important to ensure that regulations do not present barriers or blockages in dealing with the COVID-19 crisis at this time. Committee members also sought assurances that the regulations would not disrupt the manufacture or supply of essential products and goods, especially medical and other supplies. We were advised that the rule did not require closure of manufacturers subject to advice on maintaining social distancing. We discussed enforcement powers given to the PSNA and were assured that the police had powers to disperse gatherings. At the briefing, concerns were also raised about the safety of employees and business that remain open, and the question was asked whether those who failed to put in place social distancing measures would be required to close. Members flagged concerns that some businesses are reported to be operating without social distancing or PPE. The committee was advised that it remains the responsibility of business owners to ensure the health and safety of their staff if their business remains open and the need for all workplaces to adhere strictly to guidance from the Public Health Agency and from the Health and Safety Executive. Members were further advised that the Health and Safety Executive and Environmental Health Departments within Councils each have a responsibility for different aspects of this and that. Complaints may be made to the relevant body. We were also informed, however, that under the rule only the PSNA are given relevant enforcement powers but that designation of other bodies was under active consideration. I, I would be grateful for an update from the junior minister on this matter also. Members raised the important issue of communicating the regulations to ethnic minority communities, for example, in the form of leaflets and other languages. The chief environmental officer undertook to feed that back into the system and to act upon that. Finally, the question of procedures at ports and airports was raised in terms of addressing the risk of further transmission of the virus from cargo or passengers, another issue which has come to prominence recently in terms of flights carrying seasonal workers from Eastern Europe. The committee was advised that airports would be treated as, other, as workplaces in terms of social distancing requirements, but I think questions remain over the approach to individuals arriving on flights from elsewhere. Due to the urgency of the situation, the committee was unable to take the views of other committees with regards to the cross-departmental elements of the regulations as it would normally do. The committee therefore agreed to consider only the health aspects of the statutory regulation. Members acknowledged the unusual nature of the regulations and the restrictions contained therein, but were broadly supportive of the need to implement such measures in the current circumstances. The committee noted that the regulations provide that the Department of Health must review the need for restrictions and requirements imposed by the regulations at least every 21 days, with the first review being carried out by 18 April 2020, and that the regulations would cease to have effect after a period of six months. It is also crucial that we learn and implement the lessons from the start of this outbreak. We must do this swiftly to ensure that mistakes are not repeated and to prepare for further phases or surges of this virus, and the Health Committee will continue to play its part in that process. The Committee agreed that it was content with the health aspects of the statutory regulation. I would now like to add some remarks as Sinn Féin spokesperson for health. It cannot be said enough that these are unprecedented times in which we live. The scope and provisions within these regulations show the extent of the measures deemed necessary to tackle COVID-19. They say a week is a long time in politics, but it appears to be an absolute age during this pandemic. There are many parts of the regulations I could discuss at length, whether it be the makeup of the list of underlying health conditions or the provisions on public gatherings, especially the needed changes around funerals and wakes, which has a special place in our community life here in Ireland in our in towns and maybe especially in rural areas like my own. However, I will focus on the key aspects of the regulations, and this is around the powers to restrict movement and travel. The need to, re to reduce unnecessary travel and social interactions is a key response, and a response which is backed up by international evidence from the World Health Organization, the European Centre for Disease Control, and many others. 
Restrictions on travel and movement are one of the most noticeable measures to reduce social contact. The WHO indicates that these measures are effective but have a cost. These measures also lose their benefit if they are not coordinated across the entire island. The need for effective implementation and coordination across the island is essential, especially as part of a future review of the regulations. It is worth noting, I believe, that the measures were largely already observed in the north ahead of the executive, with many schools effectively closed and events cancelled and families already self-isolating. We are only now starting to see the, the benefits of that. Essentially, these measures are designed to keep the public safe, but they are also, and this is an important point for the public to recall, remember, they are also vital in keeping frontline workers and staff safe. It is brilliant for us to clap, and very well deserved to clap, health and social care workers on a, on a Thursday night. But after hearing ongoing concerns with access to PPE and difficulties in testing, one of the best things the public can do at this time is to stay home to protect and not to overburden our health service. I look forward to the time when these measures are no, are no longer necessary, a time when we have the testing and contract, contact tracing systems in place to do, as the global experts say, to test, isolate and trace, but we are not there yet. In their recently published guidance document, the World Health Organization advised a number of steps that need to be in place to deal with the situation. The first is that transmission is controlled. Second, the capacities are in place to detect, test, isolate, treat every case and trace every contact and that outbreak risks are minimised in special settings like health facilities and nursing homes, about which we are all gravely concerned. I want to quote a clear message from the WHO guidance that is important to remember. To prevail against COVID-19, we need an approach that unites in common cause every individual and community, every business and non-profit, every department of every government, every non-governmental organisation, every international organisation and every regional and global governance body to harness their collective capacity into collective action. Everyone has a crucial role to play in stopping COVID-19. Last Priyo Kiancorli, there is a saying that the night is darkest just before the dawn. But let us be very clear, we are not through this yet. And for that reason, Sinn Féin supports these regulations. Thank you, and please all be safe and take care at this time. Thank you. I call Ms Paula Bradley, the Chair of the Communities Committee. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I also join you and other members in the House this morning in offering my sincere condolences to the many families out there that have lost someone that they love dearly. And uh, also join with the Chair in his remarks that we know that death at any time is very difficult, but given the, the numerous restrictions that we have at the moment, it, it is most certainly an awful lot more difficult at this time. And also a massive um, heartfelt thank you to all of those members in health and social care that are doing a, an absolutely wonderful job at this moment, and also those essential workers that who behind the scenes um, are, are carrying out many of the aspects of daily living here in Northern Ireland that go unnoticed. Um, so a massive thank you to them also. Um, Mr Speaker, um, I rise to speak on behalf of the Committee for Communities. And while the committee hasn't formally uh, discussed these regulations, its members have been aware of those aspects which relate direct directly to the Department of Communities and the nature of my comments as chair of the committee. Mr Speaker, the restrictions outlined in the regulations undoubtedly curtail the normal activities associated with everyday life. In effect, these regulations put an end temporarily to those activities for the majority of people. However, it is reassuring that the people of Northern Ireland have responded with great understanding of the crisis we are in and the actions we must take collectively to emerge from the crisis as soon as we can with as few fatalities as possible. It is not um, an understatement to say that adherence to these regulations will save lives, and the executive has gone to some lengths to emphasise this. But people need to be reassured that the restrictions referred to in the regulations are not just essential but proportionate, and that there are clear criteria and processes in place that will allow for these restrictions to be relaxed at the appropriate time. 
Therefore, it would be helpful if the Minister would clarify how the process of review takes place and against what criteria. This will be increasingly important as the public health impact of the virus in terms of decreasing infections and deaths appears to decline and the focus turns to restoring greater normality to all aspects of our lives. This will be particularly important to our economy. So we need clarity on the evidence required to support a decision to terminate a restriction or requirement. Perhaps the Minister can shed some light on this. The economy has been significantly, significantly impacted, perhaps none more so than the hospitality industry, which plays a huge role in the wider tourism industry. Indeed, this is evident under Schedule 2, which lists the businesses subjected to restrictions or closure. My party colleague, the Minister for the Economy, has taken decisions to support these businesses, and that process is now underway. So while the regulations are extraordinary in terms of the extent of the restrictions, we should also remind ourselves and wider society that the Executive has tried to balance these with support for industry and the individual. The Committee for Communities also notes Regulation 5, Restrictions on Movement, which provide a reasonable excuse for a person to leave their place they are living. The regulations state that a reasonable excuse includes accessing critical public services, including services provided by the Department for Communities. The junior minister will be aware that these services have been significantly curtailed in order to minimise the need for a person to leave their home. But given the wide range of services provided by the Department for Communities, it would be useful if clarity was provided on what services the Minister had in mind when including this reference in the regulations. Mr Speaker, we all look forward to the day when the restrictions and requirements imposed by these regulations are lifted. But it is important, as progress is made towards that goal, that we are cautious that we don't take action too early and set back the achievements we as a society have made together. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. I, I want to thank the Minister for the statement which offered, I think, much needed clarity uh, on the regulations and some of, um, some of the rules that are being applied to those regulations. Uh, for example, the circumstances under which it is permissible to drive to a venue for exercise and when it is, when it is not. But I think there is still some inconsistency and, and I would like to invite the Minister to, to address this. For example, visiting cemeteries. Um, for, for some time now recently I have been observed how a, a supermarket near here is applying social distancing, beginning with restricting the number of shoppers within the supermarket, making sure that those in the queue uh, maintain social distancing by marking the pavement in two meter uh, lines uh, and now having a one way system up and down the aisles, which is all very good, but it 's not enforced and i don 't see how you could enforce it. What if a shopper's halfway down an aisle and turns and goes back because they 've forgotten a good nobody 's saying you can 't do that. Other people are going down the aisle the wrong way, and nobody 's enforcing that and if a shopper stops. To load the trolley, do the shoppers behind them all stop two metres, two metres, two metres behind? No, they overtake, passing each other on all those occasions much closer than two metres. And yet we permit that every day, every hour, every minute of every day, while we do not allow those who are grieving to visit the graves of their loved ones. And the testimony of, of those people uh, is heart wrenching. And the impact on their mental health is clear. So we say, yes, go to a park because it's good for your physical health, good for your mental health. But when it comes to somebody who is grieving the most natural human condition, uh, we say, I'm sorry. As the minister said, I believe I quote him, it's a price we must pay. I don't think it is. I know I could visit my father's grave at Rosalon and the Rosalon authorities because ensure social distancing was maintained in a way that is not maintained in our supermarkets on a daily, hourly and minute-by-minute -minute basis. So while I welcome uh, the Minister's statement, I think there is more we can do to be consistent, to be empathetic, to recognise our common humanity. And I would welcome him addressing that point. 
Thank you, Mr. Um, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I concur very much with your sincere words regarding our collective sympathies and thanks for those working to fight COVID-19. I rise on behalf of the Alliance Party to make a few remarks about these health protection regulations. I support these, though naturally with the reluctance that many of us feel in a liberal democracy. I want to emphasise today that the aim is to stay home and stay safe. The powers conferred allow our ministers to respond proportionately to deal with all public health aspects of planning for and dealing with COVID-19. They are far-reaching and go beyond those which we would normally be comfortable with, but the evidence clearly shows that they are necessary. The regulations are fundamentally about um, enabling um, social distancing, and we can say with some certainty that they are starting to work which demonstrates that the vast majority of people are not only adhering to the rules, but respecting the urgency and severity of this pandemic that we are all living through. I would, however, like to take a moment to recognise that there are many in our society who are legitimately struggling with this lockdown. And I want to make clear today that these regulations are designed to help them. Prime among those struggling are those who are suffering abuse at home, children, women and men, and despite the PSNI victim support and many voluntary organisations standing ready to intervene, communication with the outside world may be virtually impossible. These regulations, however, they are about staying home, but they are also about staying safe. If people are not safe in their home, they are entitled to seek support and to move somewhere safer under these regulations, which clearly state under Section 5.2m that a reasonable excuse for travel is to escape risk of harm. I also want to include in this group those children who are being denied access to one of their parents. There is evidence that some children, sorry, some people are exploiting the pandemic to frustrate co court contact orders. However, again, the regulations very clearly and very rightly state at section 5.2j that a reasonable excuse for travel includes for children who do not live with their parents or one of their parents to continue existing arrangements for access to and contact between parents and children. Some parents have contacted me, and I'm sure there are others in this chamber, who are in complete despair that their court um, contact orders have been fr frustrated. It is essential for children's well-being that this situation is not used as a legitimate mechanism for damaging loving parent-child relationships. We should also be aware that these regulations exist in the context of guidance from the government which allows people with disabilities to travel for the purpose of exercise, as Junior Minister Kearney said earlier, where, where there are specific requirements, including more than one a day. We must also recognise, however, that there are many residents who are still stuck at home, for outside exercise is not suitable to them, and they are missing their normal structured daily activities. So unfortunately, during this pandemic, their lives are being so negatively affected. And we in this chamber, I hope you will um, agree with me, give thanks to them and their carers for adhering to the stay home regulations. Lastly, the regulations are also clear that people should not have to leave home to work except where it is really necessary. Sometimes this is so, but even if someone cannot stay at home, they must be able to stay safe, be they healthcare, worker, healthcare workers, shop workers or factory workers. Their safety must be paramount and relevant adjustments made to the workplace and to equipment to make this so. As others have said today, I look forward to the, the day that we are debating how we step down and move away from these regulations and lockdown, but for now we have to, to stick with the guidance. So it is essential, therefore, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, that we ensure these regulations are both about staying home and staying safe. That is our aim for us all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And first and foremost, can I take this opportunity, um, like others have, to express my deepest sympathy to the families of all those who have lost lives um, in recent weeks to coronavirus. To lose a loved one at any time is, is very difficult, but in these circumstances it is all the more traumatic and difficult to process. It is also appropriate to recognise that there are those who have lost loved ones through conditions unrelated to COVID-19, as their grief is no less um, in these most trying of times. So um, we do, of course, um, 
think of all those here mourning today and they're in our thoughts and prayers at this time. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, the regulations brought in by the Executive, I believe, have been largely proportionate and justified in the battle we all face against COVID-19. These are not normal times. These are exceptional times that demand exceptional measures from the government. These regulations demand much of the people of Northern Ireland, and I think it's very important to state that. They make the trip to Granny's on a Sunday impossible. They close the family business that has been passed down through generations. They make the farewell to a loved one through the normal process of grief, a funeral, a wake, impossible for family circles, friends and communities across Northern Ireland. Life has changed for this parade and changed utterly. Yet the price is worth paying so that more families are not grieving today and tomorrow. So that our incredible health service and the heroes that deliver it can save lives. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I do want to commend the people of Northern Ireland for their response to these regulations. In recent weeks, we have seen the collective will of our community to beat COVID-19 by staying at home, by practicing social distancing and, be, and by being good neighbors. It has been a response that has united young and old, from the school child who misses their friends and is missing class, or maybe not, to the care home resident who is missing that cherished family visit. We have also to commend all those who have kept Northern Ireland moving. I have already mentioned our heroic healthcare workers, but we also should pay credit to many others – retail workers, farmers, postmen and women, refuse collectors, our PSNI, prison officers, delivery drivers and many, many more. Heroes all. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I do wish to raise um, several specific issues that I would encourage action on. Many in this House uh, will know that an issue close to my heart is the rights, well-being and care of those living with autism. Lockdown poses huge challenges for those with autism and their families. And Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I would urge the Executive to build on the initiatives of last week in making clear regula regulatory provision that specifically meets the needs of those with autism. And I'm glad to have received um, communication from the Department of Health to say that clarity will be given in coming days. Another issue that I would wish to raise uh, in the regulations around funerals. Funerals are a part of the grieving process. And as I said earlier, for many, the opportunity to attend a funeral or service of Thanksgiving is being denied at this time, and that sacrifice is being made. Sadly, Mr Speaker, we have witnessed a small number of people ignore the regulations and be part of funeral gatherings that go well beyond what is permitted within these regulations. And it is important that a unified voice of this House is to say, you are not above the law to these people. You do not have the right to do that which families grieving through COVID-19 have sacrificed. And I do urge the PSNI to bring those who flaunt these rules to justice for everyone's benefit. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, in conclusion, I say once again that while we ought to always have these regulations under review as the situation evolves, these regulations are necessary. Let us continue to stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. Thank you. Um, from a political perspective, uh, I would never want to introduce such restrictions on people's freedom of movement. But as many colleagues have already stated, we're living in extraordinary times. But even on a personal level, as someone with young children, two daughters aged eight and four, we're involved in the GAA. As a family, we enjoy our walks on the beaches and in our parks and forest parks. The idea of having to continue to stay at home as the evenings get brighter uh, brings many challenges. But these challenges pale in comparison to the challenges our healthcare workers currently face, and would face to an even greater extent if we relax the restrictions now. We are told we are in the surge period, and to cease with the restrictions that facilitate social distancing at this time would be, in my view, irresponsible. The economic challenges we face as a society will undoubtedly be huge as a result of this global pandemic, and we will need to support workers and business in rebuilding in the time ahead. But we need to keep our eye on the ball. This is a public health crisis first and foremost. Early decisive action 
as recommended by the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control and by the World Health Organisation, such as closures and the cancellation of sporting and other events, have been effective, but we still face challenges. We need to increase testing in the community and in vulnerable settings such as care homes. We need to ensure frontline workers have the PPE they need to carry out the vital work in a way that protects their patients, their own families and themselves. And we need to carry out proper contact tracing. Test, trace, isolate. Uh, the first three criteria set out by the World Health Organization for lifting the restrictions are one, that transmission is controlled, two, that capacities are in place to detect, test, isolate and treat every, treat every case and trace every contact, and three, that outbreak risks are minimised in special settings like health facilities and nursing homes and anywhere where there are groups of vulnerable people. We need to build our capacity to meet World Health Organisation criteria before easing restrictions. And just on, on the issue of contact tracing, on the 12th of March, uh, the British Government and Public Health England decided to end all contact tracing. And a similar decision was taken here. Yet in those countries that have been most successful in combating this virus, they have used that combination of measures of testing, tracing, isolating and social distancing. And until uh, these, and I can understand that many people uh, are feeling apprehensive about the severity of the restrictions that are being placed on society at the minute. But before we begin to ease these restrictions, we have to ensure that we build the capacity to continue to fight this virus. If we don't know where it is through community testing uh, and contact tracing, how are we going to be able to fight it? There have been many commentators, and I'm not talking about barroom commentators or barroom epidemiologists or, or, or experts in bars on infectious diseases. I'm talking well-respected uh, experts in their field, people like Gabriel Scali, who has been commentating regularly in the media, an expert in the field of public health. We need that combination of measures of testing, widespread community testing, and contact tracing, and then isolation and social distancing. And until, those, until then, though these restrictions will continue to save lives, and that must be everyone's priority. Thank you. I call Mr. Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Principal uh, Deputy Speaker, and like most, I think it's only appropriate that I begin by paying respects to those that have lost loved ones at this time, both through uh, the tragedy of uh, contacting COVID-19, but also those that have lost loved ones as a result of natural causes at this time. They're being denied the right of that basic grieving process, and I think it's only right that this House recognise that and think of them in our deliberations here in this assembly today. I would also like to again put on record my thanks to the medical professionals and the, the way in which they have dealt with this public health crisis. They are indeed a credit to us all. They are an, a credit to our health service. Uh, and I think that as time goes on, we will learn uh, to value that service and value those people in a way that is befitting of what we've been through. I welcome the opportunity here today to review uh, these regulations. I think it's important that this Assembly has the opportunity to debate them. Given the quick pace of which they came through this House, there has been limited scope and limited time for Assembly members to have their say on how this uh, pandemic has uh, unfolded throughout our community and indeed how these regulations have affected uh, our community. That being said, given the time that we've had, there has been uh, much reflection, and the, the junior minister actually made reference to this, there's been much reflection on what has been successful and perhaps other areas which need further work. And I want to particularly focus on three key elements. Uh, I listened to the chair of the executive office, Mr McGrath, who said 
The regulations that are in place are both cruel but necessary. And while I agree with the sentiment of that for a large part, for particular, and I will go on to them, for particular references and particular restrictions, I would go further to say some are both cruel and unnecessary and perhaps in part counterproductive. I talk in broad terms, but I want to cover the scope of mental health, something which this uh, Assembly, since its reconstitution, since its establishment, has really taken to its heart the cause of those that are suffering at this time. The def definition in Regulation 1-2 and the defined definition of a vulnerable uh, person the omission of mental health conditions is something that gives me great concern. Mr Nesbitt has rightly outlined one of those key restrictions in relation to mental health that I think has had a devastating impact and something that I think needs urgent review. That of access to graveyards, in particular urban cemeteries. For many, the most basic form of grieving is the visitation of that grave, whether that's to place flowers or whether that's to go in quiet times of reflection. For many of them, it is a private, dignified act of remembrance. And I feel that the regulations that are in place are cruel and unnecessary in this regard. Yeah, just in a moment, I, well, yes. Um, I want to bring them to the attention of the recent media reports that talked of an elderly gentleman, I think from County Antrim, who wanted the opportunity to go and place flowers on his um, loved one's grave. I think it was one year she had passed away and coming on the anniversary. The gate was locked, so attempted to climb the fence, impaling himself on the railing as he attempted to place flowers on that loved one's grave. I'm sorry, but I do not see how that regulation is necessary. If we can place, and society can place, uh, social restriction measures in whether it's shops, as, been, as has been alluded to, if we can place restrictions uh, in walking space, surely to goodness we can place adequate restrictions in a graveyard. This, remember, this, people do not go to visit loved ones at gravesides for mass gatherings, quiet times of personal reflection. I had an email, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, just yesterday on this very issue from a gentleman who quite briefly got to the point, please, sir, show some compassion and reopen our cemeteries. I had a bad breakdown last week. I'm ready to end it. This is getting to the point, because while we place regulations and restrictions in place to save life, and I recognise that, I recognise that in its entirety, but we also run the grave risk of taking life through restrictions that we've put in place if we do not act and act sensibly. At this stage, I'll give way to giving way. And uh, being a representative like others, I actually, from my family perspective, I have more immediate family members in a graveyard than out of the graveyard and the importance is. But would you accept that this, we don't want this to become divisive. We're all looking in the same direction, which is to get these cemeteries open for people. And I think if we're all in that vein and looking for that, what we have been stating is that it's getting the scientific evidence to say that it's okay. That should be something I feel could be sorted out by today or tomorrow. But it's just underpinning because if you start to change rules, people get confused. But scientific evidence is the way forward. And if we could get that open, I don't see that taking any great length of time. Cur with what you say in relation to graveyards, and I have no doubt that if members reflect upon this point, there, sh there should be unanimity in this House as to how we deal with this matter. Let's face it, scientific evidence, yes, I, I, I take your point, but if we have a situation where, for example, off licences can be opened at this time and people can queue in a socially restrictive manner to access that service, only common sense would tell you that the same rules should apply to a cemetery. 
I, I think this is logic. I don't think anybody should be against this principle. If done in the correct manner, and let's face it, those that attend cemeteries do so with the right frame of mind, personal, quiet reflection. So I'd ask the Assembly and I'd ask the junior ministers to please take this point on board. The next point I would like to raise, raise is parks. And the junior minister has clarified a point in relation to travel for immediate exercise, and I welcome that clarity. I think that's important and needed at this time. But I want to focus on parks that are in an urban setting. And this goes back to my point about being cruel, unnecessary, and in some ways counterproductive. Because while those that live in the countryside have access to some beautiful rural roads and some fine weather, they can walk the roads with less traffic in a quiet, peaceful manner and socially distant. But for those that live in urban settings, this is quite different. What we now have is people taking to the high street to walk up narrow streets, much closer to one another than if they were able to access that green open space within their town centres. And I think of, in this instance, Lurgan Park, for example. While the gates are closed on Lurgan Park, and I realise that's the responsibility and remit of the local council, but the point still stands, we are forcing people to move in restricted places on our pathways and on our streets, and yet closing the open space that could provide them an opportunity for daily exercise at social distance. The point that my friend uh, Ms Cameron raised in relation to autism, and I pay tribute to her because I know this is an issue in which she has lobbied heavily on, uh, and she has been a champion for those with autism in this House. Having the access to urban parks for those children with autism and parents is essential to their mental health, not only that of the child, but indeed the parent. This is a point that should be taken on board. And lastly, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I want to talk about waste management, because this is an issue, again, that I feel, on reflection of the regulations that are in place, is something that we need to uh, further explore, and it deserves further discussion. Because we have a situation where we have an increase in fly tipping, we have an increase uh, in uh, waste line in our streets, in our backyards. For those that have no access to refuge, we are creating another public health um, emergency in relation to the disposal of waste. Vermin increase, um, potential risk to individuals and young people. I think this is something that this Assembly and this Executive needs to, to really bear witness to, and the importance of a unanimity of message across the board. And we see now that there are some councils adopting a different approach. I believe, again, going back to the principle that if um, councils, or indeed uh, any other member of staff, if they can apply social distancing measures, they should do so. These are simple um, elements of these regulations that I wanted to highlight today because I feel, getting back to my litmus test, a lot of the restrictions have been cruel but necessary. That is without doubt. And I, I, I welcome them here today. I, I voted for this piece and these restrictions, but I now look further in depth at the specific regulations which I feel have been counterproductive. I have highlighted three of them. I would appreciate uh, the junior minister's time here today, and I would ask them to reflect upon these points. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Going may I get the last three, can you? And I rise to speak in favour of the um, to give approval to the coronavirus restrictions regulations. And when I last spoke uh, in this chamber on these regulations, I sent my sympathy. Uh, to the 10 people who had died across Ireland and to the 17,000 people who had died across the world. And here we are only a few weeks later and I send my deepest sympathy to the 894 people who have died across this island and the 170,000 people who have died across the world. And even as we let all of that sink in, I don't think that there's anyone 
in this chamber just listening to all of the MLAs thus far um, that's enthusiastic about having to support such restrictions on our society as are before us here today. In normal circumstances, I would be speaking loudly against such restrictions at every opportunity, at committee and in this chamber. And ideally, you know, this is not how we should or would be doing legislation. But as my opening remark shows, this is not normal times and extraordinary measures are required to tackle what is a deadly global pandemic. This public health crisis has resulted in us having to put the economy to sleep in order to save lives. Had these restrictions not been introduced, the human cost at this stage would be greater. But we cannot become complacent and we must listen to the best scientific advice. And if we reflect on the Director General of the World Health Organization last week at the COVID-19 briefing, he set out the criteria for lifting the restrictions. And we simply don't meet that criteria yet. We need to continue with these restrictions in order to break the chains of transmission and I want to commend, commend all those in places like my hometown in Derry who continue to abide by the public health advice and adhere to the, to the restrictions. It's them. It's them who have kept the death toll down. Now, there are, without doubt, there's a small number all over the north who are, however, ignoring the restrictions. And they are putting others in danger. And my appeal to all of them is to please, please stop it. Stop it. This is an incredibly hard time, particularly for our ama amazing healthcare and frontline workers. They put themselves in harm every day in every way. And the best way that we can show our appreciation is by staying at home and respecting the restrictions. It is, however, not the only way we can show our appreciation. This deadly virus has infected every level of our society, regardless of age or sex. But the evidence shows a stark reality, and that is that we are not all in this together. Those who are the low paid, from our bus drivers, nurses, agency workers, domiciliary care workers and shelf stackers, are those most likely to become infected because they are more exposed. This pandemic has shown that many of the lowest paid workers are actually society's key workers. They are our front line in responding to this deadly pandemic. And without them, it would be impossible to enact this, these regulations to save lives. These workers deserve a fair, decent, and indeed an enhanced salary. They deserve to have union representation, and they deserve to have secure employment. And we don't have to wait until all this is over to give them that and more. And as I said, these measures are, I believe, draconian, but necessary. But people are accepting their civil liberties being stripped away in the expectation that politicians like us will do everything in our power to save lives. And on that note, I've been dealing with a family in Derry. The father is critically ill with COVID-19. The mother has been infected too. And they have three children. The father is in ICU. And the family sought the life-saving and specialist treatment through an ECMO machine, which is a state-of-the-art oxygenation treatment. 
Yet when I raised the possibility of purchasing a machine for the North, which the family even offered to crowdfund, I was told that there was a specialised unit in England that provides this service. And I see this in the context of our civil liberties being removed and the expectation that people have of us politicians to save lives. So when I challenged how COVID-19 patients could travel on a plane to England with nurses who would undoubtedly get infected en route and the patient would probably die, I got a more substantial reply to confirm that the trust was looking at how people in the north could access this life-saving ECMO treatment in the south of Ireland. But nothing has yet materialised. And whilst it may be too late for this dairy father, it is not too late for others. And alas, pre Colia, you know, most reasonable people just simply don't understand why on this island we don't have an all-Ireland human health strategy to deal with this deadly pandemic, given that we do have an all-Ireland animal health and welfare strategy. This pandemic neither knows nor cares about borders. We should trace, we should track, we should isolate on an all-island basis. And on that note, I will leave it at there. Mr John Blair. Deputy Speaker, uh, thank you. And can I thank the, the Minister for bringing, bringing the motion and um, associate myself in, in opening uh, with the remarks made with regard to sympathy for those who have been bereaved, uh, to those who are suffering, and also, of course, our support from this House to our uh, excellent and valued frontline services. Uh, the Minister, Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, convincingly described the, the terms of the regulations, understandably outlined some of the frustrations around the regulations, and then rightly reminded us of the fact that those regulations are in place to save lives. After that, if I could reflect just a little more, the Chair of the Executive, the Executive Office Committee uh, referred to the need for a consistency of messaging in relation to, to these regulations and the public and uh, health and public safety relevance of this messaging and how we put that messaging out. Uh, so my wish is to concentrate on that messaging and the consistency of the delivery of that messaging across our public services. Our principal deputy speaker, in every aspect of, of the regulations, it might be possible to find restrictions which cause difficulty for an individual, for a sector or for a group. Um, if we take, for example, the restrictions laid down by our local councils um, uh, and in their services and the difficulty that creates for our ratepayers, we, we must re immediately relate that to consistency of messaging there, so as ratepayers understand the link of those restrictions to uh, restrictions on movement and the generally accepted publicly uh, important issue of social distancing. There are signs at this stage that social distancing is having an effect, though it is far too early, to be confident, let alone complacent, in this regard. So we need to be very careful about conversations around relaxation of regulations um, in this House, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I would remind members that cemeteries, which have been mentioned here today, and I'm very mindful of the sensitivities and the real grief for people in and around that issue, including some members of the House who, who have been um, bereaved recently. And that, su that subject was also um, being broadcast on, on the airwaves as I travel to this building today. So I accept that that is in the news. Access to parks was on the news during the course of the weekend. As we entered the weekend, recycling centres were a news topic. And we have to be aware that the mixed messaging emanating from these conversations is not conducive to clear guidance. It creates grey areas and uncertainty and has the potential to put already stretched public services under further pressure. So, for those reasons, Principal Deputy Speaker, I ask 
in, of course, supporting the motion that the ministers present take with them today if they can. Firstly, a request for consistency of messaging, which is steered, of course, by professional health and scientific advice. Secondly, full explanation whenever possible and as regular as possible as to the reasoning behind the restrictions and the regulations. And thirdly, that every effort is made to ensure consistency in delivery across government and different levels of government and in local government. And if that requires liaison with Solus or Nilga or any other body, so be it. So in supporting, I make those requests. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. These regulations, I don't think any of us are particularly comfortable with them, nor should we be. They are, in the main, though, necessary, though they are not perfect. And I think as time goes on, we need proactively to address the imperfections. Both Mr Nesbitt and Mr Buckley have put their finger on one of the most poignant uh, inadequacies in these regulations. The quite distressing situation that people are forbidden by law to visit the graves of their loved ones in a cemetery. As Mr Buckley pointed out, these regulations preserve the rights of people to go to an off-license, but they prohibit a citizen to go to a graveyard. You can go to the closed, enclosed space of an off-license, but you cannot go to the open space of a graveyard. How preposterous is that? And yet that is what these regulations provide for. Graveyards are not the gathering places outside of funerals, which are separately taken care of, of large numbers. They are solitary places where people, often individually, like we heard on the radio this morning, a former member of this House, Kieran McCarthy, talking about being unable to go to visit the grave of his daughter. They are solitary visits in the main. They are not rowdy, rumbustious situations that get out of hand. They are singular, but they are critical to the grieving process and indeed to the mental health of many. And yet, though we have passed, apparently, the first review of these regulations, it still maintains this outrageous restriction on any member of the public going to the grave of a loved one. Now, if there is any compassion, then that needs to be addressed. And yet we are told that on Friday the executive could not agree on that. My goodness, the junior minister finished his remarks by talking about united leadership. Well, if we can't even get leadership on an issue as elementary as that, then what hope is there for us? And when I look at these regulations, I have a query for the junior minister, presumably Minister Lance, when he comes to respond. Who within these regulations has the authority to change that? Because when I read these regulations, I read in, clause, in Regulation 2, 2, 3, 
as soon as the, Depart as the Department of Health not the Executive Office, as soon as the Department of Health considers that any restrictions or requirements set out in these regulations are no longer necessary to prevent, protect against, control or provide a public health response to the incidence or spread of infection in Northern Ireland with the coronavirus, the Department of Health must publish a direction terminating that restriction or requirement. And the restriction or requirement that I'm referring to is that which is found in Regulation 4.8, where it says a person who is responsible for a crematorium or burial ground, and it's burial grounds I'm talking about, a person who is responsible for a crematorium or burial ground must ensure that during the emergency period the crematorium or burial ground is closed to members of the public, except for funerals or burials. That's the restriction which is giving the difficulty. Now, if I read Regulation 2, 3 correctly, then the Department of Health could remove that constriction. So can the junior minister specify, is that correct? that the Department of Health, and therefore the Minister of Health, in his own right, could remove the restriction affecting burial grounds in 4.8, and that it does not require executive permission, to put it that way. And if that is so, then I would urge the Minister of Health to do it, and to do it now, because it is something which is most grievous to many. And if the Minister of Health can't do it and it requires the executive, then it will be a test of the humanity of that executive as to whether or not they do it. It really is beyond belief that that restriction exists while you can queue up, mingle in the closed premise, the closed environment of an off licence or supermarket, but can't go to the open environment of a graveyard. Really, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, that issue needs to be addressed and addressed quickly. Could I make a few other comments? Some parks have reopened. I don't take issue with that. Again, open spaces where social distancing applies. People's Park, in my constituency in Ballymena, was opened. The throughput has been 15 people an hour. What's wrong with that? You know, you read some of the medical experts, and they say being out in the open air is the best possible anecdote, uh, the best possible. Uh, provision you can make for respiratory problems. So why shouldn't the people be in parks? And why shouldn't they drive to be in a park? I noted the junior minister in his opening statement said there was nothing to stop you driving within reason to a park. I hope the PS and I were listening. And I hope we won't have a repeat of an assistant chief constable making a fool of himself on the radio by blatantly misinterpreting these regulations. Anyone who reads them would surely know that in Regulation 5 there is no restriction on driving to a park for exercise. It is quite clear. For the purposes of paragraph 1, a reasonable excuse includes the need to obtain basic necessities, including food. You can walk, you can drive. To take exercise, you can walk or you can drive. To seek medical assistance, you can walk or you can drive. And yet we've had the folly of a senior police officer telling the public 
that you can't drive to take exercise. It doesn't say that. It doesn't do anything for public confidence. An assistant chief constable can't adequately read the regulations. So I'm glad that that matter was spelt out today. Now, other issues that still require definition and refinement are the important issues relating to the opening of manufacturing and other factories. Because it is still opaque. It is still whatever you want it to mean. And it shouldn't be like that. Three weeks ago, more now, the executive feuded over what factories could be open and what factories could be closed. And to try and square that circle, the economy minister set up a stakeholders forum where for three weeks the mountain laboured. At the end of it, it brought forward a mouse. No further forward. Again, take it to mean what you want it to mean. And that is a lamentable failure of this executive. The junior minister needn't talk about united leadership. If ministers in that executive cannot agree that if a factory can operate social distancing, then it can and should be open. Because at the end of this, Mr. Principal Speaker, we have to have an economy. And therefore, the common sense that so often is missing needs to be applied. So these are regulations. The danger with them is that in some ways we get used to their, to their abnormality. They are abnormal restrictions. We must not, as politicians, as a House, get used to this as the norm. We must re-establish the rights of people to go about their daily business as they see fit. We must lift the hand of a government from oppressing in that manner. Yes, we must do it when it's safe to do so. But there are some things in here myself, Mr Buckley and Mr Nesbitt have referred to, which are utterly oppressive, utterly unnecessary, and should be removed forthwith. Thank you. Thanks, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, we're weeks into this crisis, and it's scandalous, to say the least, that this executive has only now put out legislative guidelines about what businesses can and can't open. Uh, once again, the executive have followed, uh, have told the Tory snail's pace, waiting for uh, them to act, while leaving small businesses uh, and their owners in limbo, allowing big businesses like Bombardier to do what they like, and worst of all, putting the lives of workers uh, at risk. So slow has this executive been to act that we have seen workers forced to walk off the job because of a lack of PPE uh, or social distancing uh, in place, uh, forced to take action because ministers would not. And I want to raise the deeply concerning issue of Bombardier uh, in particular. Uh, this new law sets fines and potential prosecutions for people in gatherings of more than two. Can we expect that Bombardier, for forcing non-essential workers to gather uh, en masse, will receive hefty fines for putting workers at risk? I doubt it. Uh, yet I see nothing in either the government's specification or indeed in these legislative changes that would indicate that building airplanes, uh, building airplane parts is an essential service uh, at this time. So why does Bombardier feel that it is able to announce it will reopen very, very soon? Is it the case that a minister and this executive has actually given Bombardier the go-ahead to reopen and designate as essential work? And if this is the case, um, we urgently need the executive to come clean on it. Uh, and the minister will be responsible for risking the health of our communities in favour of a quick buck from Bombardier bosses. And much 
uh, was raised through the debate about the actions of individuals, uh, but not a single comment about Bombardier uh, at all. And I want to speak to uh, Mr Deputy Speaker about construction sites which have been publicly shamed for opening and forcing workers on site while this executive has turned a blind eye. It is shameful that profit margins and the economic interests of bosses here seem to be elevated above the health and needs of our communities. Every day, it seems, I am contacted by a worker or an employer who is totally baffled by the guidance here, who have no idea what their rights are, and who are terrified they are bringing this virus home to their families. They needed protection from the executive for months, but have been left in limbo. They deserve better. Thank you. I call upon the junior minister in the executive office, Mr Gordon Lyons, to wind on the debate. Mr Lyons. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I say at the outset that I welcome today's debate and the uh, thoughtful and sincere contributions of the members uh, who spoke. This is the first time that we have had to take uh, legislation through the Assembly on behalf of the Executive Office. Uh, and just a few weeks ago, it would have been unthinkable that we would be introducing regulations that would have such far-reaching consequences uh, into almost every aspect of the lives of our citizens. These regulations are detrimental to our economic well-being. They restrict our civil liberties. They separate us from our friends and our families, but they save lives. In, or in ordinary times, these restrictions would be abhorrent uh, to all those who value the, the freedom to get on with our lives in the way that we want without interference from the state. But they are sadly necessary as we fight this invisible and deadly enemy. Thankfully, people have been adhering to the rules put in place out of respect for each other uh, and our NHS. And I want to thank everyone uh, for doing their bit and helping us to stop the spread uh, of this virus. And Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I know that it hasn't been easy. I have heard the stories of the heartache that people are facing. From those who can't be with their elderly relatives, uh, from those who have had to miss out on attending the funeral of their loved ones, uh, from those um, who are fearful uh, about their economic security uh, or their, their business because it's had to close. And I know that it's not natural for us to stay apart from each other uh, in this way. We are mostly uh, social beings that, that thrive uh, on interaction. However, I hope that people will be able to take some comfort uh, in the fact that their sacrifices are, hel are helping uh, to keep people uh, alive. And that's why we have to, to stick to uh, the rules that we have uh, and that we need to maintain uh, social distancing, uh, as difficult uh, as this may uh, be. I do want to turn to some of the points that members have made. And it's clear that there were uh, recurring themes uh, woven through many of the, the contributions. Uh, that includes the unprecedented un uh, nature of these regulations. Uh, the courage and selflessness of health and social care staff, and the many others working in public services and businesses to keep things going. Uh, the importance of supporting the bereaved uh, and the vulnerable, uh, and the need uh, to turn our minds uh, to recovery. Turning to some of the uh, specific points then that were made, first of all, the chair uh, of the committee has, has rightly pointed out the cross-cutting uh, nature of the response to COVID-19 uh, and the need for a joined-up approach all government across all government departments. Uh, and I can assure him that the Executive Office and the Department for Health will continue to work closely together uh, on this matter. Uh, he talks about looking at the uh, possible relaxation of, of restrictions. Obviously, the first review was, was considered by uh, the Executive, 
uh, and, and no changes uh, were made at that time. But the next review uh, will start to look at the timescale uh, for easing some of the restrictions to get more of the economy uh, working again uh, and to ease the burden on citizens. This obviously does uh, call for, for careful judgment. Easing the restrictions too early risks the resurgence of the uh, outbreak, pro prolonging them uh, for too long uh, would damage the economy uh, and civic society. But we will be guided, uh, as ever, by what the science tells us um, uh, about our success in, in, in tackling the outbreak uh, and, and the level uh, of, of risk. The member is right to say that we need an evidence-based, uh, carefully communicated um, strategy when that time comes, and I can assure him uh, that work on that is underway. Uh, I'll give away to the member. Could I ask the junior minister, what does the science tell him about it being okay to utilise the closed space of an off licence, but it is wrong to singularly uh, utilise the open space of a cemetery? Could he expound on that science, please? I am going to come to that, that point later on when I address the comments made by, by Mr Buckley, Mr Nesbitt uh, and, by, and by Mr Alistair. Uh, in terms of the, the contribution then from Colin Gildernew, um, regular reviews of the regulations will of course include looking at best practice uh, in, in other areas uh, as well. And uh, in terms of his comments that he made about businesses operating safely, um, the engagement forum uh, established by Minister Dodds had, had reduced the code of practice um, in relation uh, to that. Uh, enforcement by district councils was another uh, area that he, he mentioned. This will be kept under uh, review. There are no plans to designate councils at, at present. However, if and when the executive concludes that some of the restrictions can uh, be lifted safely, for example, more retail businesses and, and public services being allowed to open, uh, then the need to involve councils uh, would, would become uh, stronger. Uh, Paula Bradley, um, speaking in, uh, from her position as, as chairperson, uh, had uh, asked again of, about how and when the, the relaxation of these restrictions uh, would, would take place. And uh, as, as I've said previously, this will obviously call for, for, for careful judgment uh, uh, around um, uh, this and, and making sure that we take in uh, to consideration um, guidance from the uh, scientific uh, advisory group on emergencies uh, and the, the modelling group uh, as well. She also referred to the classification of essential or critical services. Now, this isn't, isn't defined, uh, as she will be aware, the regulations do. Um, it includes some which would be considered to be essential services. That, that's not a compre fully con comprehensive uh, list. Um, but if we believe the provision needs to be broadened, then we will bring forward uh, uh, an amendment to that. I do want to come on now to the comments that were made by um, Mike Nesbitt, um, Jim Allister and, and Jonathan Buckley, uh, as well in regards to, to cemeteries and graveyards. And they made um, very powerful points and very, very powerful uh, contributions um, in relation to this, this issue, and, and we do recognise the sensitivities around that. I've been contacted by a number of, of constituents, and indeed uh, by people outside my constituency as well, who are having an incredibly tough time uh, as a result uh, of this regulation. And I, and I am well aware um, of, of the pain and the suffering that some people are going through. And this is not just for people who have been, been recently bereaved either, because we all know uh, that the, the pain uh, that comes from bereavement um, can remain acute um, many years uh, afterwards, uh, after a death takes place. I've been contacted by, by, by one father uh, of a four-year-old girl uh, who died a number of years ago. Her mother is a nurse in our health service. Uh, and some of the only comfort that she can get uh, is by visiting her daughter's grave on the way to and the way home uh, from work. So I have a huge amount of sympathy uh, with, uh, with, with that family. I heard of somebody else who for the last 50 years uh, had visited the grave uh, of her mother uh, on her birthday. And she's found it exceptionally difficult uh, that she can't do that. So uh, for one moment, I don't want people to think that I'm not aware uh, of the sensitivities around this. 
and, and I, I am extremely uh, sympathetic uh, to the points uh, that were made. And so, um, Mr. Alistair had asked that the specific question about the scientific adv advice that is av available. Obviously, we will, we will be asking um, Chief Medical Officer or, or, or others um, about their advice in relation to that. But I think we need to ask ourselves some, some, some common sense questions as well. Can social distancing uh, be uh, maintained? Is it likely um, that this will, will increase uh, the spread of the virus? We also need to look at the, the, the number of people that might expect it to, uh, to be there at, 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 in a cemetery or at a grave. Uh, and as we can uh, assume, that would be, be a very small uh, number. And we do have to take into consideration as well uh, the health uh, and, and the, the mental health uh, and well-being of individuals in our society uh, as well. So all of those things will be uh, taken into consideration, uh, and I can promise the members that, that we will um, look into uh, this uh, and that we um, take all of those things um, uh, uh, under consideration, and, and, and we will, of course, um, um, and be looking into them. But ultimately, it will be a decision um, f for the executive uh, to take. So, I'll give way to the member. I appreciate not only your comments but your tone. Um, and respectfully, I say, I mean, I'm no scientist, but you give me a scale map of, for example, Roselawn Cemetery, and I will show you a way to ensure social distancing, not of two metres, but of 20, how many people can access the cemetery at any given time, and a one way system that, that guarantees people don't overlap and cross as they would do in a supermarket aisle. I think that could be done today. That, that is obviously what we will be, be, be taken into consideration uh, as well. Uh, and I thank the member for his comments, and I do realise uh, how sensitive uh, this is. And I know that nobody uh, in the executive is wanting to cause undue harm uh, or, or pain uh, at, at this time. Uh, I want to move on to... I'll give way to Mr Alves. Uh, the member says that we will do this, we will do that, we'll take all these things into consideration. Has the executive already discussed this issue? and made a decision to make no change. Could he be forthright with us on that? And if the executive has made that decision to make no change about cemeteries, could he please explain it to us? Well, obviously, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, or Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, we um, uh, have obviously uh, internal discussions within the executive. Those, those discussions are uh, internal. It's not appropriate for me to, um, uh, to, to talk about those uh, at this time. Um, but certainly, um, not only do these regulations have to uh, be reviewed every three weeks, but they can be reviewed uh, at, at any time. Moving on to the comments that, that Paula Bradshaw uh, had made, I want to, to agree with her on the um, very difficult situation that many find themselves in as a result of, of domestic uh, abuse or the difficult circumstances that they might find themselves in because of having to stay uh, at home. Uh, I fully agree with the um, member that, that it's right that these people um, can leave home if they need to get uh, that help. And I'm, I was also reminded of the, the comments made yesterday by the uh, Health Minister uh, in relation to um, the, the need for people to continue to access medical help um, if they need it. That, that's really, really important. That, um, we're obviously seeing a, a huge reduction in the number of people accessing um, health services at this time, for example, in emergency departments. Uh, but people should go um, and, and get support and get help um, when they need it, and that shouldn't stop simply because uh, of, of, of COVID. I uh, also agree with what the member said in relation to um, parental uh, rights or responsibilities uh, and the rights of children for, for contact uh, with their parents uh, as well. Pam Cameron made um, the absolutely key point that it's not um, uh, the regulations that are saving lives, but, but the fact that our citizens are, are observing those, uh, and uh, in addition, the, the, the courage and the professionalism of those that work within uh, our health service. And I do want to put on record once again our thanks to all of those within the health and social care sector that are doing so much uh, to look after us and to protect us at this time. And I also pay tribute to, to our pharmacists because I think that our pharmacists can often be, be forgotten about, but they are just as much on, on the front line uh, as many, of, many others um, within, the, within the healthcare uh, sector. And also pay tribute to all of those key workers out there that are doing so much, including our farmers, uh, including all of those in agri-food and processing, um, and, and those in haulage and transportation that are doing so much uh, to make sure 
um, that we can continue to, to, have, to have food and all of the other supplies uh, that we need. Can I also thank Mrs Cameron for her work uh, in terms of autism uh, and reassure her that the PSNI uh, have assured the executive that they will take uh, a reasonable, proportionate uh, approach to, to enforcement uh, and one that recognises the particular needs of people with autism or indeed with, 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 other, with other conditions. Um, Mr Sheehan um, spoke in, in some detail in regards to the need for, for PPE, and that's absolutely right uh, and appropriate, and the need for um, uh, testing and resumed uh, contract, uh, contact uh, tracing. Of course, winning the war against uh, COVID-19 will require uh, winning more than, than one battle, but planning for that future phase uh, is, is now uh, underway. Um, uh, Mr Buckley then made comments, I've obviously addressed the issues around, around cemeteries, obviously uh, he made com uh, comments in relation to parks, that's not an issue um, within these regulations, um, that is up to those that, that operate uh, parks, uh, but um, uh, we, we, uh, we, we have heard the, the, the comments that he, he has made. Um, additionally, he made comments about household uh, recycling uh, centres. Obviously, um, different councils have taken uh, different approaches to this. We, re we recognise the need uh, uh, for commonality, but the uh, dear minister does intend to bring forward uh, more information on that uh, later on uh, this week. Um, Martina uh, Anderson rightly emphasised um, um, the, the, the stress and, and difficulty that this is, is causing uh, for, for an awful lot of people. Um, she raised um, a member specific to, to one constituent. I'm very sorry to hear the, the suffering that that family uh, is, is facing at this time. This is not a matter, obviously, for the regulations, um, but I will ask the, the Health Minister to reply to her um, in, in relation uh, to that. Um, Mr. Um, Mr. Carl then um, had also raised a, a, an issue around uh, Bombardier. Uh, I think that the member has not understood um, the regulations in, in that regard. There's no restriction on manufacturing companies such as, as Bombardier being able to, to operate. Uh, however, Bombardier, like all companies, must ensure uh, that its employees can, can work safely uh, and that uh, enforcement of, of statutory duties in, in health and safety legislation um, is, is maintained. That that's already there within, within current legislation uh, and that needs to be uh, adhered to. Um, I think I, I, I addressed the issues as well that, um, uh, that Mr Alistair had raised in, re in relation to, to burial grounds, um, but in relation to the authority to change uh, regulations. The member is correct that the Department of Health can terminate um, any restriction within the regulations. However, the Minister for Health, uh, recognising the, the cross-cutting and sensitive nature of the re regulations, uh, had referred the matter to the executive uh, for uh, consideration um, on that uh, as well. I'm sorry to, to Mr Blair, I haven't forgotten about him, I've just, just left him uh, to last. He, he, he made an important point about the, the need for consistent and, and clear messaging. Uh, I completely agree uh, with that and certainly um, uh, we are saying that these regulations uh, need to stay in place. Of course there will always be reviews, uh, of course there may, may always be things that we need to tidy up or that we need to, to clarify. Um, however, I, I hope that the message is going out very clearly here today of the, of the need for these regulations. Uh, and for the, for the importance uh, of them. Uh, and I can assure the member that there is um, regular and ongoing dialogue uh, uh, with, with Solus um, at this time. Um, Mr Speaker, if, if any members feel that there have uh, been points that I have not uh, addressed, let me assure them that I can, of course, respond in writing uh, in the days uh, ahead. And in conclusion, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, making these regulations by any uh, standard of normal democracy um, is a necessary but deeply uncomfortable course of action for us to take. Uh, and today in this assembly, we must do this uncomfortable thing because the alternative is far, far worse. Uh, for it would involve the needless deaths of thousands of our fellow citizens and overwhelm our fantastic health service and the first class staff who work in it. So we need to have the courage um, to do that which is unpalatable to prevent much worse consequences. And that means that I'm in the strange position of um, seeking the approval 
in the assembly of uh, legislation and at the same time longing for the day uh, when it can uh, be repealed. And, and Mr Deputy uh, Speaker, these regulations uh, will be repealed at some stage. Let's remind ourselves that this is only temporary. We are not asking people to adhere to these restrictions forever, but simply for a period that will end. And that's why it is so important that we do uh, adhere to them and we remember that it only is for, for a short time. We will be able to look forward uh, to a time when the restrictions will be lifted and citizens can once again uh, enjoy the freedoms that we cherish. We can look forward to a time when we can support the vulnerable, uh, comfort the bereaved and properly mourn the departed. And we can look forward to a time when we can celebrate those heroes uh, that have done so much uh, for us. In short, we can uh, look forward to a, to a time of normality. Uh, and when normality does return, uh, be under no illusion, we have a lot of work to do. First of all, we must rebuild our economy, learning from the painful, uh, learning from the, the painful lesson that um, our, our economy uh, can, can be shook up uh, very, very easily and in a short period of time. So building future resilience must be central to that. And secondly, uh, we must rebuild our, our health and social care service. The response of that service uh, and everyone who works in it has been truly uh, magnificent. And so in return, we must nurture and transform that service, investing in its capacity, investing in its resilience, and above all, investing in its people uh, to show how we value them. Until then, Mr. Speaker, we need these regulations to protect that service and to protect us all. And so therefore I commend uh, the regulations to the Assembly. Thank you. The question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restriction Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 be approved. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary if any. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. A point of order, Mr. Allister. Mr. Speaker, any parliament or assembly worthy of the name takes a serious view of a minister misleading that assembly. And it's such an episode that I want to draw to your attention. On the 23rd of March in this House, the Deputy First Minister, no less, told this House that the executive had signed a contract for PPE equipment, inferring it was with China, causing great hope and expectation amongst our hard-pressed national health workers. It turned out there was no such contract. I say that on the basis of what her colleague, the Finance Minister, Mr Murphy, told the Finance Committee on the 8th of April that no contract was signed. He didn't know why the Deputy First Minister had claimed that and misled the, the House, I say, in that. Uh, and yet today we had a debate where there was an opportunity for the Deputy First Minister under the Executive Office business to come to this House to correct and to withdraw and apologise for misleading this House. But as is clear, she hasn't done that. That's why I left it to the end of this debate to raise that issue. Then on the 23rd of March, she, in response to Mr McNulty, she said, just this morning, we signed a contract which will see additional PPE brought in. She previously told Mr McGrath, at a meeting this morning, we were told through finance, we've been able to secure a contract. None of that was correct. This House was misled by a senior minister in this House. And I'm asking you, as the person occupying the Speaker's chair today, to take action on that. And I would respectfully suggest the appropriate action would be to refer the matter to the Standards and Privileges Committee. I thank the member for his point of order. Um, Matters relating to conduct in the Chamber are covered in Standing Orders No. 65, 69A and 70. 69A in particular relates to the power of the Commissioner for Standards, who has responsibility in this area. 
What I would suggest to the member is uh, that he should write to the Speaker's office and seek a ruling on the matter, and I'm sure it will be issued to him uh, within a very short period of time. I hope that that satisfies the member. That this matter could be referred to the Commissioner for Standards, I have to respectfully suggest it could not. But, well, not only because there isn't one, but because his powers are restricted to the actions of MLAs, not ministers. And uh, indeed, now that you give me the, the opportunity, I'm hoping, of course, to bring legislation before this House, which will plug that lacuna. Uh, but uh, the actions of a minister, and it was a minister uh, acting as a minister who misled the House, uh, cannot be investigated by the Standards Commissioner. Uh, but uh, I certainly think the Standards and Privileges Committee is the right place for this to be further inquired into. If you require me to write to the Speaker's office to put in writing what I've said here, which will appear in the public record, it seems a bit unnecessary to me, but I'll do it nonetheless. The member is very obliging. The next item of business is a motion to approve a draft statutory rule. I will ask the clerk to read the motion, please.